Hey guys, welcome back to Into the Pit. Um, so, that first little story there, also called Into the Pit, really blew up for my channel anyway. We got 400 views in the first, I don't know, first couple days, which for me is really good. Um, so I'm definitely going to be continuing this because i got to get that sweet, sweet views. I don't know. Um, today, anyway, we're going to be reading the second story, To Be Beautiful. Uh, in my opinion, not as good as the first, but still really weird. Um, also a bit of a slow burner at the start, but towards the end it really... I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to spoil anything. Um, and yes, to those, you, to those of you who've been asking me to read Fetch, don't worry, it's coming. It's going to happen. Uh, I'm just going to finish this, bu this book first, as soon as I can, so, um, see you then. For now, to be beautiful. Flat and fat. Those were the two words that Sarah thought of when she looked in the mirror, which she did a lot. How could somebody with such a curved belly be as flat as an ironing board everywhere else? Other girls could describe their shape as being like an hourglass or a pear. Sarah was shaped like a potato. Looking at her bulbous nose, her prominent ears, and how all her parts seemed to be stuck on her body at random, she was reminded of the Mrs. Mixon match doll she had as a kid. The one with different eyes, ears, noses, mouths, and other body parts that you could stick onto her to make her look as hilarious, hilarious as you wanted. And so that was the nickname that she came up for herself. Mrs. Mixon match. But at least Mrs. Miss, Mrs. Mixon Ma Oh, this is going to be... Oh, the, ugh, ugh, if only I could just speak proper English, man. <sighs> but at least Mrs. Mixon Match had Mr. Mixon Match. Unlike the girls at school whom she called the Beautifuls, Sarah didn't have a boyfriend or any prospect of one. Sure, there was one boy she looked at, dreamed of, but she knew he wasn't looking at or dreaming of her. She guessed that she, like Mrs. Mixon Match in her single days would just have to wait around until some equally unfortunate-looking guy came along. But in the meantime, she needed to finish getting ready for school. And I just realized how awkward this is going to be for me to read this. Alright. Still looking at her worst enemy, the mirror, she applied some mascara and pink-tinted lip balm. For her birthday, her mom had finally given her permission to wear a little light makeup. She gave her dull, mousy brown hair a thorough brushing. She sighed. It was as good as it was going to get. And it wasn't good. The walls of Sarah's room were decorated with photos of models and pop stars she had cut out of their magazines. Their eyes were smoky, their lips full, their legs long. They were slender, curvy, and confident, young but womanly, and their perfect bodies were wearing clothes Sarah couldn't even dream of, a, dream of affording. Sometimes, when she was getting ready in the morning, she felt as if these goddesses of beauty were looking at her with disappointment. Oh, they seem to say, is that what you're wearing? Or, no hope of a modeling career for you, sweetheart. Still, she liked having them there. If she couldn't see beauty when she looked in the mirror, at least she could see it when she looked at the walls. In the kitchen, her mom was dressed for work in a long floral print dress. Her mom never wore wit makeup or did anything special with her hair, and she had a tendency to put on weight around her hips. Still, Sarah had to admit her mom had a natural prettiness she herself lacked. Maybe it skips a generation, Sarah thought. Hey, Cupcake, Mom said. I picked up some bagels. I got that kind you like with all the seeds. You want me to pop one in the toaster for you? No, I'll just have a yogurt, Sarah said, though her mouth watered at the thought of a toasty everything bagel slathered in cream cheese. I don't need all those carbs. Mom rolled her eyes. Sarah, those little yogurt cups you live on just have 90 calories in them. It's a wonder you don't pass out from hunger in school. She took a big bite of the bagel she had fixed for herself. She had put the top and bottom together sandwich style, and cream cheese squished out when she chomped on it. Besides, Mom said, her mouth full, you're much too young to be worried about carbs. And you're much too old not to be worried about them, Sarah wanted to say, but she stopped herself. Instead, she said, a yogurt and a bottle of water will be plenty to hold me over until lunchtime. Suit yourself, Mom said, but I'm telling you, this bagel is delicious. Unlike most mornings, Sarah actually made it to, to the school bus in time, so she didn't have to walk. She sat by herself and watched YouTube makeup, to <laughs> makeup tutorials on her phone. Maybe on her next birthday, Mom would let her wear more than mascara and tinted lip balm. 
She could just get what she needed done to do some real contouring to make her cheekbones look more pronounced and her nose less bulbous. Getting her brows done professionally would also really help. Right now, she and her tweezers were fighting a daily battle against a unibrow. Before first period, as she got her science book out of her locker, she saw them. They strutted down the hall like supermodels doing a runway show, and everybody, everybody stopped what they were doing to watch them. Lydia, Jillian, Tabitha, and Emma. They were cheerleaders. They were royalty. They were stars. They were who every girl in the school wanted to be, and who every boy in the school wanted to be with. They were the beautifuls. Each girl had her own particular brand of beauty. Lydia had blonde hair and blue eyes and a rosy complexion, while Jillian had fiery red hair and cat-like green eyes. Tabitha was dark with chocolate brown eyes and lustrous black hair, and Emma had chestnut hair and enormous doe-like brown eyes. All the girls had long hair, the better to flip luxuriously over their shoulders, and were slender but with enough curves to fill out their clothes in the bust and the hips. And their clothes! Their clothes were as beautiful as they were, all bought at high-end stores in big cities they visited on their vacations. Today they were all wearing black and white, a short black dress with a white collar and cuffs for Lydia, a white skirt with a black and white polka dot mini skirt for Jillian, and a black and white striped... What are they? Penguins? A voice cut off Sarah's admiring thoughts. Huh? Sarah turned to see Abby, her best friend since kindergarten, standing beside her. She was wearing some kind of hideous poncho and a long, loose, floral-printed skirt. They looked like she, she looked like she could be running a fortune-telling booth at the school carnival. I said they looked like penguins, Abby said. Let's hope there aren't any hungry seals around. She made a loud barking sound, then laughed. You're crazy, Sarah said. I think they look perfect. You always do, Abby said. She was hugging her social studies book against her chest. And I have a theory about why. You have a theory about everything, Sarah said. It was true. Abby wanted to be a scientist, and all those theories would probably come in handy one day when she was working on her PhD. You know how we used to play Barbies when we were little, Abby said? When they were little, Sarah and Abby each had pink carrying cases filled with Barbies in their various clothes and accessories. They had taken turns carrying their cases to each other's houses and had played for hours, stopping only for juice box and graham crackers, graham cracker breaks. Life had been so easy back then. Yeah, Sarah said. It was funny. Abby hadn't changed much since those days. She still wore her hair in the same braids, still wore gold wire-framed glasses, and the braces on her teeth and a few inches of height were the only differences. Still, when Sarah looked at Abby, she could still see that at least the opportunity for beauty was there. Abby had a flawless coffee with cream coat complexion and startling hazel eyes behind those glasses of hers. She took dance classes after school and had a graceful, slender body even if she hid it under hideous ponchos and other baggy clothes. Sarah had no beauty and it tormented her. Abby had beauty but didn't care about it enough to notice. My theory, Abby said, getting animated the way she did when she was lecturing is that you used to love to play with Barbies, but now that you're too old for them, you need a substitute. Those empty-headed fashionistas are your Barbie substitute. That's why you want to play with them. Play? Sometimes it seemed like Abby was still a little kid. I don't want to play with them, Sarah said, though she wasn't sure this was exactly true. I'm too old to want to play with anybody. I just admire them is all. Abby rolled her eyes. What is there to admire? the fact that they can match their eyeshadows through the outfits. If you'll excuse me, I think I'm going to go on admiring, I don't know, Rosa Parks. Sarah smiled. Abby had always been such a nerd. A lovable nerd, but still, a nerd. Well, you've never had much interest in fashion. I remember how you used to treat your Barbies. Abby grinned back. Well, there was the one I shaved bald, and then there was one with the hair I colored green with a magic marker so she looked like some kind of crazy supervillain. She wiggled her eyebrows. Now, if those teen queens would let, me, would let me play with them that way, I might be interested. Sarah laughed. You're the one who's a supervillain. Nope, Abby said, just a smart aleck, which is why I am way more fun than those cheerleaders. Abby gave a little wave and then hurried off to class. At lunch, Sarah sat across from Abby. It was Friday, which was pizza day, and on Abby's tray was one of the school's rectangular pizza slices, a cup of fruit cocktail, and a carton of milk. School's pizza wasn't the best, but it was still pizza, and it was pretty good. Too many carbs, though. Sarah had hit the salad bar instead, and had gotten a green salad with low-fat vinaigrette dressing. 
She liked ranch a lot better than vinaigrette, but ranch added too many calories. The other kids at the table were the nerds who hurried through through lunch so they could play card games until a bell rang. Sarah knew the beautifuls called it the loser table. Sarah stabbed at her lettuce with her dull plastic fork. What would you do, she asked Abby, if you had a million dollars? Abby grinned. Oh, well, that's easy. First I'd... Wait, Sarah said, because she knew the kind of thing Abby was going to say. You're not allowed to say you'd give it to the Humane Society or the Homeless or whatever. The money's just to spend on yourself. Abby smiled, and since it's imaginary money, I don't have to feel guilty. That's right, Sarah said, crunching on a baby carrot. Okay. Abby took a bite of pizza and chewed thoughtfully. Well, in that case, I'd use it to travel. Paris first, I think, with my mom and dad and brother. We'd stay in a fancy hotel and go to the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and eat at the best restaurants and stuff ourselves with pastries and drink coffee at fancy cafes and people watch. What would you do? Sarah pushed her salad around on her plate. Well, I'd definitely get my teeth professionally whitened, and I'd go to one of those high-end salons and get my hair cut and colored. Blonde, but a realistic-looking blonde. I'd get skin treatments and a makeover with really good makeup, not the cheap drugstore kind, and I'd get a nose job. There are other cosmetic procedures I'd like to have, but I don't think they do them on a kid. And they shouldn't, Abby said. She looked shocked, like Sarah had said something really bad. Seriously, you'd put yourself through all that pain and suffering just to change the way you look? I had my tonsils taken out, and it was horrible. I'd never, had, I'd never have another operation if I can help it. She looked at Sarah intensely. What's wrong with your nose anyway? Sarah put her hand to her nose. Isn't it obvious? It's huge. Abby laughed. No, it's not. It's just a regular nose. A nice nose. And when you think about it, does anybody really have a nice nose? Noses are kind of weird. I actually like animal noses better than people noses. My dog has a really cute nose. Sarah shot a glance over to the beautiful's table. All of them had perfect noses. Not a potato nose in the bunch. Abby looked over to the table where Sarah was looking. Oh, the penguins again? Okay, so the thing about penguins is that they may be cute, but they all look alike. You're a person, and you should look like an individual. Yeah, an ugly individual, Sarah said, pushing away her salad plate. No, a nice-looking individual who worries too much about her appearance. Abby reached out and touched Sarah's forearm. You've changed a lot in the past couple of years, Sarah. We used to talk about books and movies and music. Now all you want to do is talk about how you don't like the way you look, and about all the clothes and hairstyles and makeup you wish you could afford. And instead of having pictures on your wall of cute baby animals like you used to, you've got pictures of all those skinny models. I liked the animals a lot better. Sarah felt anger rising like bile in her throat. How dare Abby judge her? Friends were supposed to be the people who didn't judge you. She stood up. You're right, Abby, she said, loud enough that the other people at the table turned to look at her. I haven't changed. I've grown up, and you haven't. I think about adult things, and you still buy stickers and watch cartoons and draw horses. <sniffs> Sarah was so angry that she marched off and left her tray on the table for somebody else to clean up. By the time school was over, Sarah had a plan. She wasn't going to sit at the loser table anymore because she wasn't going to be a loser. She was going to be as popular and as pretty as she possibly could. It was amazing how quickly her plan fell into place. As soon as she was home, she dug into her dresser drawer where she kept her money. She had $20 of birthday money from her grandma and 10 left over from allowance. It was enough. The beauty supply store was just about a 15-minute walk from her home. She could get there and back and do what she needed to do before her mom got <clears throat> home at 6. The woman at the checkout counter had obviously dyed bright red hair and fake eyelashes that made her resemble a giraffe. When Sarah brought some hair dye to the checkout, the lady gave her an interesting look. Now, if you want to have hair that looks like the picture, you know you'll have to bleach it first, she said. Bleach it how? Sarah asked. Her mom used bleach and water to clean the floor sometimes. Surely this wasn't the same thing. You'll want to get the peroxide that's on the back of aisle two, the cashier said. When Sarah returned with the plastic bottle, the woman looked at her with narrowed eyes. Does your mom know you're about to color your hair, hun? Oh, sure, Sarah said, not making eye contact. She doesn't mind. She didn't know if her mom would mind or not. She guessed she would find out. Well, that's good then, she said, ringing up Sarah's purchases. Maybe she can help you. Make sure you got the color on good and even. At home, 
Sarah locked herself in the bathroom and read the directions from the box of hair color. They seemed simple enough. She put on the plastic gloves that came with the hair dye kit, draped a towel around her shoulders, and worked the peroxide into her hair. She wasn't sure how long to leave the peroxide on, so she sat at the edge of the bathtub and played a few games on her phone and watched some YouTube makeup tutorials. First, her scalp started to itch. Then it started to burn. It burned as if someone had thrown a handful of lit matches into her hair. She quickly typed into her phone, how long to leave peroxide in hair? The answer that appeared was no longer than 30 minutes. How long had she left it in? She jump jumped to her feet, grabbed the deta detachable shower head, turned the water on cold, leaned her head over the tub, and started spraying. The frigid water soothed her fiery scalp. When she looked in the bathroom mirror, her hair was stark white, like she had become an old woman ba way before her time. The bathroom stank of bleach, making her nose run and her eyes water. She cracked the window and opened a bottle of hair color. It was time to complete her transformation. She shook up the hair color ingredient in a squeeze bottle and squirted the mixture all over her hair and massaged it in. She set the alarm on her phone to go off in 25 minutes and settled in to wait. By the time her mom got home, Sarah was going to look like a whole new person. She played happily on her phone until the alarm, alarm buzzed, then rinsed off again with a detachable shower head. She didn't bother that... She didn't bother with the conditioner that came with the hair color kit because she was too anxious to see the results. She toweled off her hair and stepped over to the mirror to see the new her. She screamed. She screamed so loud that the neighbor's dog started barking. Her hair was not platinum blonde, but sewage green. She thought of Abby when they were little, coloring her Barbie's hair with a magic marker. Now she was that Barbie. How? How could she do something to make herself pretty and end up even uglier than before? Why was her life so unfair? She ran to her mom, flung herself on the bed, and cried. She must have cried herself into a miserable sleep, because the next thing she knew, her mom was sitting on the edge of the bed, saying, What happened here? Sarah looked up. She could see the shock in her mom's eyes. I, I was trying to color my hair, Sarah sobbed. I wanted to be blonde, but I, I'm... You're green, I can see that, Mom said. Well, I would say there would be consequences for coloring your hair without my permission, but I think you've already experienced some of those. You are going to clean up the bathroom, though. But for right now, we need to see what we can do to make you look less like a Martian. She touched Sarah's hair. Oof, it feels like straw. Listen, uh, put on your shoes. The hair salon at the mall should be able to fix this. <laughs> Sarah put on her shoes and stuffed her moss-colored tresses into a baseball cap. When they got to the salon and Sarah yanked off the cap, the stylist gasped. Well, it's a good thing you've called 911. This is definitely a hair emergency. An hour and a half later, Sarah was back to having brown hair, now a few inches shorter because the stylist had to cut off the damaged ends. Well, Mom said, once they were in the car on the way home, that was a big chunk of my paycheck. I probably should have just let you go to school with green hair. It would have served you right. Sarah returned to school, not in a blaze of platinum blonde glory, but as her usual mousy brown self. Still, when lunchtime rolled around, she resolved that, even without blonde hair, she wasn't going to sit at the loser table. She served herself from the salad bar that walked right past where Abby was sitting. She didn't need Abby to criticize her today. A knot formed in her stomach as she approached the beautiful's table. They must have decided today was jeans day, because they were all wearing cute, skinny jeans with fitted jewel cover jewel-colored tops, and matching slip-on canvas shoes. Sarah sat down at the opposite end of the table, far away, enough away that she didn't seem to be intruding, but close enough that they could include her if they wanted. She waited a few minutes, expecting one of them to tell her to go away, but nobody did. She was relieved and hopeful, but then she realized that none of them even seemed to see her. They just kept right on with their conversation, like she was invisible. Sarah pushed her salad ar around on her plate and tried to follow the conversation, but she had no idea who they were talking about, and she certainly wasn't going to ask them. Probably they wouldn't even hear her if she had said something. If they couldn't see her, they probably couldn't hear her either. She felt like a ghost. She picked up her tray and headed toward the trash can, desperate to get out of the cafeteria. Desperate to get out of the whole school, really. But there were still 7th and 8th periods to suffer through. Boring social studies and stupid math. Lost in her suffering, she bumped right into a tall boy, dumping the remains of her salad on his crisp white shirt. 
She looked up into the ocean blue eyes of Mason Blair, the most perfect guy in school, the guy she always hoped might notice her. Hey, watch where you're going, he said, picking a cucumber slice off his expensive designer shirt. The vegetable had left a perfect, oily circle in the middle of his chest. Sorry, she squeaked, then threw the rest of her salad, what Mason wasn't wearing, into the trash and half ran out of the cafeteria. What a nightmare. She had wanted Mason to notice her, but not in this way. Not as the ugly, clumsy girl with fried, frizzy brown hair who gave a new meaning to the words tossed salad. Why did everything have to go wrong for her? No one ever did anything stupid and clumsy except her. When the school day finally dragged to an end, Sarah decided to walk home instead of taking the bus. Given how her day had went, she didn't feel like she should take the risk of being with a big group of kids again. It would just be inviting disaster. She walked alone, telling herself she might as well get used to solitude. She was always going to be alone. She passed the brown cow with the ice cream stand where the beautifuls went with their boyfriends after school, laughing as they sat together at picnic tables, sharing milkshakes or sundaes. And of course the beautifuls could scarf all the ice cream they wanted and not gain an ounce. Life was so unfair. To get to her house, Sarah had to walk past the wrecking yard. It was an ugly expanse of dirt, filled with the destroyed corpses of cars. There were smashed-in pickup trucks, squashed SUVs, and vehicles that had been reduced to nothing more than rusted heaps of junk. She was sure none of the beautifuls had to pass such a place so hideous on their way home. Even though the junkyard was horrible, and maybe because it was so horrible, she couldn't help looking at it when she passed by. She was like a passing driver gawking at an accident on the side of the road. The car nearest the fence definitely fit into the heap of junk category. It was one of those big old sedans that only very elderly people still drove. The kind of car Sarah's mom called a land yacht. This yacht had seen better days. It had once been light blue, but now it was mostly rusty orange brown. In some places, the rust had eaten all the way through the metal, and the car's body was so battered it looked like it had been attacked by an angry mob wielding baseball bats. Then, she saw the arm. A thin, delicate arm was sticking out of the trunk of the car, its little white hand with fingers outstretched, as if waiting hello, or waiting for help, like someone who was drowning. Sarah burned with curiosity. What was the hand attached to? The gate was unlocked. Nobody seemed to be watching. After looking around to make sure nobody was nearby, she stepped inside the wrecking yard. She approached the old sedan and touched the arm, then the hand. It was metal from the feel of it. She found the handle on the trunk and pulled it, but the lever wouldn't budge. <laughs> the car was so dented and battered that the trunk wouldn't open and close properly anymore. Sarah thought of the story a teacher had read to her class once in elementary school, about King Arthur pulling a sword from a stone when, when nobody else could. Could she pull this doll, or whatever it was, from this wrecked vehicle? She looked around until she found a strong, flat piece of metal that could maybe work as a substitute crowbar. Sarah braced her foot against the car's crumpled bumper, slid the metal inside the trunk door, and pried upward. The first time she tried to open it, it didn't give at all, but the second time, it flipped open and threw her off balance. She fell backward and landed on her butt in the dirt. She stood up to inspect the owner of the hand she had seen sticking out of the trunk. Was it a discarded doll? owned by some little girl and tossed in the trash to end up in the dump? The thought made Sarah sad. Sarah pulled the doll from the, trump and, from the trunk and stood it up on its feet, though once she looked at it, she wasn't sure doll was the right word to describe it. It was a few inches taller than Sarah herself, and it was jointed so that its limbs and waist looked movable. Was it some kind of marionette? A robot? Whatever it was, it was beautiful. It had wide, green, long-lashed eyes, pink Cupid's bow lips, and circles on its cheeks. Its face was painted like a clown's, but a pretty clown. Its red hair was pulled up into twin pigtails on top of its head, and its body was sleek and silver, with a long neck, a tiny waist, a rounded bust and hips. Its legs and arms were long, slender, and elegant. It looked like a robotic version of the gorgeous supermodels whose pictures hung on the walls of Sarah's room. Where had it come from, and why would someone want to get rid of such a beautiful, perfect object? Well, if whoever put this thing in the dump didn't want it, then Sarah did. She picked up the girl-shaped robot and found it surprisingly light. She carried it sideways, her arm around its delicate waist. At home in her room, Sarah set the girl robot down on the floor. It was a little tarnished and dusty, 
as if it had been in the trash heap for a while. Sarah went to the kitchen and got a rag and a bottle of cleaner that was supposed to be safe for metal surfaces. She sprayed and wiped the front of the robot inch by inch from head to toe. The shininess made it even more beautiful. As Sarah got behind the robot to clean the other side, she noticed an on-off switch at the small of its back. After she finished wiping it down, she turned the switch position to on. <laughs> Nothing happened. Sarah turned away, slightly disappointed. The robot was still cool to have, though, even if it didn't do anything. But then, a rattling sound made Sarah turn back around. The robot was shaking all over like it was either going to rev up or break down entirely. Then, it went still. Sarah resigned herself once more to the idea that the robot wasn't going to do anything. Until it did. The robot's waist pivoted, making its upper body move. It slowly raised its arms and then put them down. Its head turned to face Sarah, seeming to look at her with its big, green eyes. Hello, friend, it said, in a slightly metallic-sounding version of a young girl's voice. My name is Eleanor. Sarah knew the thing couldn't be talking to her personally, but it felt like it was. Hi, she whispered, feeling a little silly for entering into a conversation with an inanimate object. I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you, Sarah, the girl robot said. Whoa, how had it said her name back to her? It must have some pretty sophisticated built-in computer or something. It was the kind of thing her brother might know about. He was in college majoring in computer science. The robot took a few surprisingly smooth steps towards Sarah. Thank you for rescuing me and cleaning me up, Sarah, Eleanor the robot said. I feel as good as new. She gave a pretty feminine twirl, her short skirt billowing. Sarah's mouth was hanging open. Was this thing, of, was this thing capable of actual conversation or actual thought? Um, you're welcome, she said. Now, Eleanor said, placing her cold, hard little hand on Sarah's cheek, you tell me what I can do for you, Sarah. Sarah stared at the robot's blankly pretty face. What do you mean? You did something nice for me. Now I must do something nice for you. Eleanor cocked her head like an adorable puppy. What do you want, Sarah? I want to make your wishes come true. Uh, nothing really, Sarah said. It wasn't the truth, but really, how could this robot make her wishes come true? Everybody wants something, Eleanor said, brushing Sarah's hair away from her face. What do you want, Sarah? Sarah took a deep breath. She looked at the images on her walls. She might as well say it. Eleanor was a robot, and she wouldn't judge her. I want, she whispered, feeling embarrassed, I want to be beautiful. Eleanor clapped her hands. To be beautiful, what a wonderful wish. But it is a large wish, Sarah, and I am petite. Give me 24 hours, and I will have a plan to start making this wish come true. Okay, sure, Sarah said, but she didn't believe for one minute th that this robot had the ability to transform her looks. She couldn't even quite believe that she was having a real conversation with it. When Sarah woke the next morning, Eleanor was standing in the corner, as still and lifeless as the other decorative objects in Sarah's room, no more alive than the stuffed Freddy Fazbear she'd had on her bed since she, she was six. Maybe the conversation with Eleanor had just been a particularly vi vivid dream. <laughs> That afternoon, when Sarah got home from school, Eleanor pivoted her waist, raised and lowered her arms, and moved smoothly over to Sarah. I made you something, Sarah, she said. Eleanor put her hands behind her back and produced a necklace. It was a chunky silver chain with a large cartoonish silver heart pendant dangling from it. It was unusual. Pretty. You made this for me, Sarah, Sarah said? I did, Eleanor said. I want you to make me a promise. I want you to put this necklace on and never, ever take it off. Do you promise you'll keep it on, always? I promise, Sarah said. Thank you for making it for me. It's beautiful. And you will be beautiful, too, Eleanor said. Since your wish is so big, Sarah, I can only grant it a little at a time. But if you wear this necklace and keep it on... Each morning when you wake up, you'll be a little more beautiful than the day before. Eleanor held out the necklace, and Sarah took it. 
Okay, thanks, Sarah said, not believing Eleanor for a minute. But you put on the necklace anyway because it was pretty. It looks good on you, Eleanor said. Now, for the necklace to work, you have to let me sing you to sleep. Like now? Sarah asked. Eleanor nodded. It's early, though. Mom isn't even home for, from work yet. For the necklace to work, you have to let me sing you to sleep, Eleanor repeated. Well, I guess I could take a little nap, Sarah said, not entirely sure that she wasn't already asleep and dreaming. Get into bed, Eleanor said, moving in her smooth stroll to the side of Sarah's bed. Even though she was a robot, everything about Eleanor was so feminine and lovely. Sarah pulled back the covers and got into bed. Eleanor sat on the edge of the bed and stroked Sarah's hair with her cold little hand. She sang. Before she sang the last note, Sarah was asleep. Sarah was usually grumpy and groggy in the morning, but this morning she woke up feeling great. Eleanor, she noticed, was standing still in the corner of the room in her inanimate object pose. Somehow, Eleanor being there made Sarah feel safe, as if Eleanor were standing guard. Maybe she was just an inanimate object, Sarah thought, as she sat up in bed. But then she reached up and felt the silver heart pendant hanging just below her throat. If the necklace was real, the talk she had with Eleanor must be real, too. As she moved her hand away from the necklace, she noticed something else. <clears throat> her arm. Both her arms, actually. They were slimmer and more toned, somehow. And their skin, which was usually sallow, was healthy and glowing. The dry patches of skin she was prone to had disappeared, and both arms were soft and smooth to, to the touch. Sarah ran to the mirror to give herself a full inspection. Same mix-and-match face, nose, and body, but now with a perfect pair of arms and hands. She thought of Eleanor's words from last night. Each morning when you wake up, you'll be a little more beautiful than the day before. Sarah definitely was a little more beautiful. Was this the way it was going to work? That every morning a different part of her would be transformed? She darted to the corner where Eleanor was standing. I love my new arms and heads. Thank you, she said to the unmoving robot. So, like, am I going to wake up every morning to one new part until I'm totally transformed? Eleanor didn't move. Her face kept the same painted-on expression. Well, maybe I'll just have to wait and see, huh? Sarah said. Thanks again. She stood on tiptoe, kissing the robot on its cold, hard cheek, and then hurried to the kitchen for breakfast. Her mom was sitting at the table with a cup of coffee and half a grapefruit. Wow, I didn't even have to yell at you to get out of bed this morning, Mom said. What's going on? Sarah shrugged. I don't know. I just woke up feeling good. I slept well, I guess. She poured some cornflakes into a bowl and drenched them with milk. Well, you were already passed out when I got home. I thought about making you f waking you for dinner, but you were out like a light, Mom said. She watched as Sarah shoveled in cereal. And you're eating real food, too. Would you like the other half of this grapefruit? Sure, thanks, Sarah said. As she reached for the grapefruit, her mom grabbed her hand. Hey, when did you let your nails grow out? Sarah knew she couldn't say. Last night, so she said... Over the past couple of weeks, I guess. Well, they look fantastic, Mom said, giving her hand a squeeze before she let it go. Healthy, too. Have you been eating those vitamins I bought you? Sarah hadn't been, but said yes anyway. Good, her mom said, smiling. It's definitely paying off. After breakfast, Sarah selected a pink shirt that complemented her nail color and took some extra time with her hair and makeup. At school, she felt a little less invisible. Eleanor seemed to be mostly nocturnal. When the last of the winter daylight started to fade, she pivoted her waist, moved her arms up and down, and sprang to life. Hello, Sarah, she said in her tinny little voice. Are you a little more beautiful than you were yesterday, just like I promised? Yes, Sarah said. She couldn't remember ever feeling so grateful. Thank you. Eleanor nodded her head. Good. Are you a little happier today than you were yesterday? I am, said Sarah. Eleanor clapped her little hands. Good, that's what I want. To grant your wishes and make you happy. Sarah still couldn't quite believe all this was happening. That's really nice of you, but why? I told you why. You saved me, Sarah. You pulled me out of the trash heap, cleaned me up, and brought me back to life. And now I want to grant you wishes, just like a fairy godmother. Would you like that? Her voice, while metallic, also sounded kind. Yes, Sarah said. Who wouldn't like a fairy godmother? 
Good, Eleanor said. Then never, ever take off that necklace, and let me sing you to sleep. When you wake up, you'll be a little more beautiful than you are today. Sarah hesitated. She knew her mom had thought it was weird when she came home yesterday evening and found Sarah already asleep. If Sarah, if Sarah fell asleep early every night, her mom would know she would worry she was sick or something. Plus, there was the homework issue. If she stopped doing her homework, that, that too would arouse suspicion, both at home and at school. I'll let you sing me to sleep, Sarah said, but could it be in a few hours? I need to eat dinner with my mom and then do my homework. If you must, Eleanor said, sounding a little disappointed. But it is necessary that you let me put you to sleep as early as possible. It's important that you get your beauty rest. After a spaghetti dinner and an hour and a half of math and English, Sarah took a quick shower, brushed her teeth, and put on her, night her nightgown. Then she approached Eleanor, who was standing still in her corner. I'm ready, Sarah said. Then get in bed, like a good girl, Eleanor said. Sarah climbed under the covers, and Eleanor came to the bed. She sat on the edge of the bed and reached out to touch Sarah's heart-shaped pendant. Remember to keep it on, and always, always, never, ever, take it off. I'll remember, Sarah said. Eleanor sang a lullaby once again, and once again, Sarah fell asleep before she knew what hit her. She woke feeling refreshed, and when she stood up, she seemed to stand a little straighter, a little prouder, a little taller. She ran to the mirror and pulled up her nightgown to expose her legs. They were magnificent. She was no longer stubby Mrs. Mixmatch with legless feet stuck onto her dubby body. Her legs were long and shapely. Sarah usually wore jeans to school, the better to cover her stubby limbs, but today she was going to wear a dress. She ran to her closet and took out a lovely lavender dress. Her mom had bought her this last spring. She hadn't liked the way it looked on her then, but now it showed off her long, shapely arms and legs. She slipped on some ba ballet flats and admired her reflection in the mirror. She still didn't look exactly how she wanted to, but she was definitely making progress. She put on the little bit of makeup she was allowed to wear, then went down to breakfast. Her mom was standing at the stove, stirring eggs in a pan. Look at you, you're a knockout. Is it picture day or something? No, Sarah said, sitting down at the table and pouring herself a glass of orange juice. I just felt like making an effort today. Is there somebody special you're making an effort for? Bob asked. Sarah's mind wandered for a moment to Mason Blair, but then the image turned into her bumping into him and covering him with salad. No, just for me, I guess. Mom smiled. Wow, that's really nice to hear. Hey, do you want some eggs? Sarah suddenly felt hungry. Sure, she said. Her mom dished up scrambled eggs and toast for each of them and sat, and then sat down. I don't know what it is, Mom said, but for the past couple of days, you've just seemed to be much more mature and easy to talk to. She sipped her coffee and looked thoughtful. Maybe you've just been growing, going through an awkward stage that last year or so, and you're starting to outgrow it. Sarah smiled. Yeah, I think that might be it. The awkward stage was my entire life before I met Eleanor, Sarah thought. At school, she saw Abby in the hall and felt a peg of missing her. The two of them had had so much history together, going back to the days of finger paint and Play-Doh. But Abby was stubborn. If Sarah waited for Abby to apologize to her, it might never happen. She walked up to Abby at her locker. Hey, Sarah said. Hey. Abby dug around at her locker and didn't make eye contact with her. Listen, Sarah said, I'm sorry I said those mean things to you the other day. Abby finally looked at her. Hey, you weren't wrong. I still do like cartoons and stickers and horses. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. Stickers and horses are car and cartoons are nice. And you're nice. And I'm sorry. Friends? She held her hand out, and Abby laughed and hugged her and said. When Abby pulled away from the hug, she looked Sarah up and down. Hey, have you gotten taller or something? There was no way she could explain it. No, I'm just working on, better, on having better posture. Well, you're definitely succeeding. Eleanor had put Sarah to sleep with her usual sweet song the night before. This morning, still lying in bed, she looked at her body to see if she could tell which parts had gotten an upgrade. To her surprise, the parts of her that had been soft and flabby were now tight and toned. And parts that had been flat and childish were now rounded and feminine. Sarah chose a fitted t-shirt and a denim 
a denim miniskirt to wear to school. When she went down for breakfast, her mom once again looked at her a bit odd. She once again asked Sarah if anything had been different about her, if she'd been changing the way she dressed, and she had, but it was more than that, and her mom could tell. It feels like it happens overnight, Mom said. Because it does, Sarah thought. Um, I think that's all for now. Um, it's it's been like 40 minutes. Uh, I'll do part two of this soon, and that's where things start to get, um, different. Different, for sure. Yeah, alright. Uh, see you soon.